Hello and welcome to uh, UCL Global Health. We're in the middle of the largest global financial crisis for 80 years with potentially devastating economic as well as health consequences. And I'm delighted to be joined by Anne Pettifer, who's director of the Policy Research in Macroeconomics Group. And Anne, uh, I remember you gave a lecture here 10 years ago, mm. well before the onset of the crisis, mm. where you highlighted the huge levels of debt and mm. lack of savings in the Western world yeah. and that we were heading for a crisis. So you were one of the very few mm. economists that spotted this all coming. Yeah. What are, I mean, we mentioned economic consequences of the crisis. What about the health consequences? Well, I think, you know, they're really extreme. Um, and they are at the level of suicide. If you think of yesterday, um, Spain uh, suspended the foreclosure of homes, the closing down of homes, of the kicking of people out of their homes because of an increase in the suicide rate on one end of the spectrum. And then the sort of mental health effects of, of the millions of young people that are unemployed and the stress and the family tensions and the dislocation caused by that. But generally, unemployment is well known to have, you know, very severe health effects. And that is before we start talking about people going hungry, which is also what's happening and what the nutritional impact of that will be on young people. Now, I worked in Africa before and they're very familiar with all of that. We in the West have been used to high standards of living and we are not prepared for it, I don't think. I'm very struck by the BBC Archers. Uh, I'm an Archers fan. And they have a young couple in there who struggle to buy the tin of baked beans to keep their two children fed. And, and, so, and, and I think they've struck a nerve there because that's happening to many British families, never mind the European families, where the crisis is sometimes more severe. OK, so we've had a massive banking crisis. The debts have been transferred to sovereign governments. Yeah. And most economists <clears throat> the last four years have said the only solution is austerity. Yeah. We've got to spend less, we've got to borrow less, we've got to live within our means. But you say they're wrong. Why is that? Well, I think it's a great intellectual heist, if you like, because what we are really faced with is a private debt crisis, both in the Eurozone and in Britain, but also in the United States. Masses of private debt accumulated by banks in particular. I don't believe there's a single bank, really, in, in, in the Anglo-American sphere that can be described as solvent, that could survive without government subsidies and guarantees and backups. So we have banks that are effectively insolvent, being propped up by governments, by taxpayers, and then we have a private sector, individuals that took out more than they can really afford to repay and who are now losing their jobs thanks to austerity. And then there's firms. And firms are hoarding cash. They're not spending their yeah. money uh, because they're fearful. A, they have debts that have to be paid. Secondly, there are no customers coming through the door. And so they're hoarding. And in those circumstances, that is the crisis we're facing. The public debt is really not the crisis. And by some amazing slate of hand, uh, those who are anti-government and anti-public sector for the sake of, you know, ideologically undermining the public sector have taken the opportunity of this crisis to focus on the public sector. Now, of course, in a crisis like this, when the private sector starts to save, the public sector's debts increase. It's just the way the system works. And um, rather than dealing with this, the public sector debt, which has risen not to outstanding levels, they were much higher, for example, after the Second World War. The government should be attending to this part so, of the so economy, the, the private is, sector. So the problem is not primarily debt, it's demand. And you're a Keynesian economist. Yeah. So you think that where private demand goes down, the government should step in and create demand through investment in things like infrastructure and jobs, yeah. job creation. The point is this, that when the private sector is as heavily indebted as it is at the moment, through crazy, reckless lending caused by governments deregulating the, the whole lending process, mm. um, that is the moment when they cannot invest for very sound reasons. They have big problems. That's the moment at which government has to intervene in order to, to prevent the economy slumping as a whole. Mm. And for the government to impose austerity on an economy crippled by debt is very cruel, not to mention incompetent. Would you have a bond crisis? I mean, would you, if the British government decided to stimulate the economy to the tune of 
50, 100 billion pounds, would suddenly everybody desert UK gilts and bonds? The point is, if the government were dependent on private bond buyers, on those bond vigilantes that we mm. so often get blackmailed with, then there'd be a worry. But we're not Greece. Greece is prevented by the laws of the Eurozone, by the Maastricht mm. Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, from borrowing from a central bank. It has to borrow from Goldman Sachs. Not so for Britain. We have a central bank called yeah, the Bank exactly. of England. It is a nationalised bank. And right now, it is financing fully a third of the government's debt. It's effectively paying the deficit. And it's doing that by the magic of money creation, which is a wonderful magic. A lot of my <coughs> colleagues in the New Economics Foundation and so on are against this power, but it's an amazing power. The fact that we have a banking system that works means that we are able to create money, as we did in 2007, to bail out the banks. But it also means that we could create the money and manage it properly to deal with Alzheimer's or to deal with with mental health problems. Mm. In, a, in a sound banking system, there's never a question of a shortage of money. Yeah. And right now, the Bank of England is financing, and we saw Mr. Osborne yesterday, grab £20 billion uh, pounds from, the government, from the Bank of England's chest to help um, correct his own imbalances. But he has every right to do that, because that is government money, because the Bank of England is a government bank. Can I come in with the international picture? I mean, it's interesting that the IMF seem to be coming round to your point of view, with China's growth rate falling, Europe now in recession, America slipping back. They're starting to argue very much the same, is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the report uh, by Oliver Banchard in the IMF's recent <coughs> World Economic Outlook was astonishing. And it caused massive repercussions in the economics community, precisely because it challenges austerity. It says, actually, you know, cut the legs off an economy, and you know what? It's not going to run. Mm. Um, now, that's blindingly obvious to you and me, and it has been obvious to those of us who you looked at what Ke uh, Keynes' experience in the 1920s and 30s and learned from that. Uh, it's very unfortunate the IMF has come to this so late in the day, but at least they have. Uh, unfortunately, the European Union hasn't, um, and many others in the IMF have not yet taken that on, and certainly in the finance ministries, including our own. The dogma that cutting the legs of an economy is the best way to make it run prevails. Just finally, let me, uh, are we being over-optimistic? Let me, a couple of things. Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart have written a famous book about the history of these financial crises and say that after a financially induced recession, recovery may be at least eight to ten years or longer. And there are others that say the Western world is now really going the way of Japan, which I read today is in its fifth recession in 15 years, mm. really flatlining. And given that populations have now peaked, some are going down, do we just have to accept that for the next few decades we're going to be in a period of almost zero growth? We're going to have to cut costs, our children are going to face a much gloomier economic future than us? No, not at all. And I give you the example of Roosevelt in 1933. Roosevelt came to power at a time when austerity was imposed in Europe, uh, on in particular Germany. Germany had a combination of austerity on the one hand and ca capital mobility on the other. Um, Keynes in 33 took charge here of both the Treasury and the Bank of England, if you like, of monetary policy and began to introduce capital control. And so did Roosevelt. Roosevelt refused to attend the Global Economic Conference of 1933 and subverted it. And he turned the, econ the American economy around and it recovered sufficiently that in 1937 they felt they had to impose austerity again and he was advised by Kenneth Rogoff's of that day to impose austerity and the economy slumped and he quickly pulled it out again. Quickly realised his mistake which was both an economic mistake but also a political mm. one. And by 39 the, the US economy was, was steaming along and of course the war helped enormously after that in boosting uh, activity in the US. But Rogoff and Reinhardt ignore the lessons of that period. They ignore the fact that between 1945, if you look at their famous chart, which shows cap financial crises from 1800 to 2007, there's a period 45 to 71 where there is no financial crisis anywhere in the world. Mm. And when I've, I've challenged Rogoff on that, Kenneth Rogoff, for the matter, 
And he simply says, oh yes, but they had capital control in those days and we can't have that again. Mm. Well, why not? We can restore stability to the global economy and we can do it quickly, but not if we pursue the path that Rogoff and Reinhardt so committed the, the, to. The hope is that in America, with Obama's second term, there may well be uh, stimulus for demand. But in Europe, do you see any signs? Do you think we're, we're already in a depression with unemployment above depression levels in Spain and Greece? health effects that you've talked about, do you see any room for optimism in, in Europe? Because it seems everyone is signed up to austerity. Well, except for the IMF. And the IMF today, for example, is arguing over, over Greece. And that, the fact that there's division between in the ranks of the creditors gives me hope. But honestly, when I hear the leaders of Europe, um, Angela Merkel and our own Prime Minister, it's clear that that actually they haven't learned. And, and I'm not entirely confident that Obama has the mandate or the will, the political will, to impose a fiscal stimulus on Congress or to, to use his, his election results to mm. force Congress to take a different direction. So no, I'm not, pes I'm not optimistic, but I do know that we know how to get out of this mess. Okay. And we've done it before, we can do it again. Well, I think the story will run and run. Perhaps you should come back in six months and we'll review progress. And thanks very much. Thank you.